Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our networking lunch plenary session, Across the Aisle, a conversation about PCORI's achievements and opportunities. Please welcome PCORI's Chief Engagement and Dissemination Officer, Gene Slutsky. Good afternoon. Judging from the sound of conversation um, in the, the room, it's clear you've not only gotten lunch but made new connections with some of the over 1,000 members of the healthcare community joining us for our fourth annual meeting. I also hope that you've uh, found our sessions to date to be as interesting as I have, particularly the questions and comments we've heard from all of you our speakers and their partners. Hopefully they've helped paint a picture of some of the substantial progress PCORI is making in generating evidence that can help all of us here and our friends, families, colleagues across the country make better informed healthcare decisions and to include everyone, patients and stakeholders in how we generate evidence, disseminate and translate evidence. We're going to shift gears a bit now and hear from two prominent members of the healthcare community, both Capitol Hill veterans and two people I very, very much admire. As reflected in our session title, one is a Democrat and one is a Republican, and both have deep understandings of how the healthcare system works and an equally deep commitment to making it better with patients' needs front and center. And that's why we're privileged to have former U.S. Representative Tony Coelho, and Dr. Philip Gingry with us for a conversation about PCORI's achievements and opportunities <laughs> to do even more to serve all the stakeholders represented in this room and outside this room listening on webinars and Twitters, Twitter feeds and so forth. And please note, and this is important, that I mentioned Tony first because C comes before G alphabetically. <laughs> But in the true spirit of bipartisanship, I'll give you Phil's bio uh, highlights first. So Dr. Philip Gingry is an obstetrician gynecologist, and he's a senior advisor to the district policy group at Drinker Biddle. He is a Republican who served Georgia's 11th congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2003 to 2015. He served on numerous influential committees, including the Committee on Energy and Commerce and its Health Subcommittee, authored and supported a number of major health-related initiatives, and founded the GOP Doctors Caucus, a very important group uh, in Congress. Tony Coelho is chairman of the Partnership to Improve Patient Care and a former Democratic representative from California who served from 1979 until 1989. He's a longtime and passionate advocate for the rights of people with disabilities. He is the primary author and sponsor of the American with Disabilities Act. And you can see from many of the things that we have here at this conference to aid and make sure that we're accessible to all people who are here, what an important act this was. He also is past chair of both the Epilepsy Foundation from 2005 to 2007 and the American Association for People's with disabilities, um, 2009 to 2011, both on the boards of directors. So I think you can see why we're really excited about this conversation. So to kick things off, it's also my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Sue Peshin. She's president and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. And as many of you know, the Alliance is dedicated to accelerating the pace of scientific discoveries and their application to improve the experience of aging and health. And I think we can also agree they do a terrific job at that. So help me welcome Sue, and let's get started. Thank you, Jean. It's such an honor to be here with both of you. I consider you both legends, and I'm just privileged to do this with What do you mean by you. legend? <laughs> the double meaning, right? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a, a very quick acknowledgement 
Um, I noticed this morning at the first plenary that someone was here from UPMC. I know that there are a number of folks from Pittsburgh, and we know you all had a tough week. I'm a native Pittsburgher myself. Um, wanted to let you know this is a safe, positive place, and just wanted to say Pittsburgh strong. So we re welcome your questions today. You all have cards on your tables. If you decide that you want to submit a question, please you know, just write something down. Lift your card up in the air, and folks are going to come around and, and get them from you. So please submit your questions. We would love this. a great opportunity. You don't want to miss it. Uh, I want to just thank these guys one more time for coming. They, they are busy, 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 doing great work. And just please join me again. All right, we're going to get started. Just dive right in. So part of PCORI's mandate is to assist patients, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers to make better informed healthcare decisions. And PCORI does this uh, by advancing the quality and relevance of evidence about diseases and health conditions. From both of your perspectives, do you think that PCORI has been successful in carrying out this mandate, and why? Well, Sue, uh, thank you for the question, and, and th thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here uh, with uh, Representative Quello. Uh, we have become good friends uh, in a short period of time. Uh, yes, I, I absolutely think that, uh, that Corey is accomplishing uh, that mission. Uh, I went to one of the breakout sessions before uh, this uh, Across the Aisle uh, plenary that we're doing right now, uh, and, and, and they talked about the history of uh, the uh, creation of PCORI, which uh, the, the model for uh, PCORI uh, w was uh, uh, thought, thought of maybe three or four years even before the Affordable Care Act was passed, and it was incorporated as part of that. Uh, and now here we are 12, uh, 14 years later, how time flies, and as I look at it and study it and think back on it, have been there, been there at the time uh, as a Republican doctor physician member on the Energy and Commerce Committee, and very opposed to not only PCORI, but everything, uh, <laughs> every section, it seemed, of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and, but uh, as I look back on it now, uh, I, I can clearly see that that section that we were so worried about in regard to comparative effectiveness research uh, and uh, interfering with the doctor-patient relationship and that the patient not really having sufficient input uh, in, in research and decision-making, uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable today to say that PCORI has definitely and is continuing to fulfill that mission. Studies. Some studies that uh, near and dear to my heart, because as an OBGYN physician, ovarian cancer, uh, preeclampsia research, uh, and then another, uh, uh, prostate uh, uh, comparative effectiveness research in regard to uh, watchful waiting and really do nothing uh, versus robotic uh, 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 surgery, laparoscopic type surgery, or radiation, needle implants, these sort of things. Uh, and, and you realize when the studies are done, at the end of the day, that patient who has the disease needs to have the input to say, well, you know, it, it maybe watchful waiting is better, uh, but uh, I like to play tennis and golf and run and jog, and uh, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm scared to death. I want to have something done uh, more proactive than watchful waiting. Uh, that's a perfect example of how the patient input, patient-centeredness, ha has been successful part of PCORI. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that it's great to work together um, and look forward to continuing that. Um, I think the, the thing to remember is that when uh, PCORI was set up, um, patients weren't at the table. And um, the significant thing about PCORI <clears throat> is that by statute, patients are on the board. Mm -hmm. 
That's the first time that's ever happened for us. And that's very, very significant and something that we have to remember. Now, the second thing is, is that uh, a lot of the research that was done prior to PCORI uh, was something that uh, went on and when it was done, it took like 10 years or 12 years and so forth. And in this whole period of time, those of us who have a disability, uh, wondering when are they gonna get there? When are they gonna decide what is helpful to us? And the reason that PCORI was set up is to actually get involved with patients. You know, when medicine deals with an issue, uh, they're dealing with my body. Mm -hmm. So all this research is about my body. And I think that my body should have a role played in what comes up. And that's what this is all about. And so those of you that are here from the patient communities, uh, you need to understand that that's the reason for PCORI. That's the reason we need to get it reauthorized. That's the reason that we need to be at the table. Mm -hmm. Now, people will say that, you know, maybe there's a double use of research funds or whatever. And I would say, no, look, at NIH and ARC have their role. They have a job to do, and do it. But PCORI has a job to do is my quality of life. It's not to cure something. It's basically, how do I live with whatever I have? How do I have a better life as a result of what I have? And Bacori does a lot of research in this area, and that's key. Because some of us may not want or not looking for the cure. Look at I've had epilepsy for uh, seizures for 60 years, still have them. Um, and I'm not looking for a cure, I'm just looking for a better quality of life. How do I enjoy myself more? What do I do? And I've been very for, fortunate, I've been blessed by God that I can do a lot of things. And that's all of us, that all of us as patients, that's what we want. We want to have research done that, that helps us as individuals to live a better life. And I'll tell you what, if you increase my quality of life, that's gonna save the taxpayer a lot of money. If you increase my quality of life, you increase the quality of life for my loved ones. And people forget that. The quality of life for a family as a result of what you do for a patient is critically important to that family, but critically important financially to everybody, including taxpayers. And they never measure that. But if I, my seizures, or somebody else with epilepsy has seizures three or four or five times a week, and the family has to be there consistently to monitor and, and help and so forth. And then all of a sudden, research comes in and, and you can change that quality of life. What is the impact on that family? They can do things they couldn't do before. They can participate in things they couldn't participate before. That's why PCORI is important. That's why PCORI needs to be reauthorized. That, and we, there are things that we need to do for modifications and so forth, but that's the reason that PCORI needs to be reauthorized. Excellent, I love it. Both of you, great answers. One thing, one thing I would love to add to what you said, Tony, is in terms of the research that is done at places like ARC and NIH, PCORI is an amazing complement. They're oftentimes a partner. So there's nothing repetitive about this. It's really about adding to the work that our federal agencies are doing. And we were just on the Hill yesterday. A whole bunch of you who are out here, I know, were, were with us on the Hill. And where's California? I was with the California Del Hello, people. Um, and you guys were great. And we got asked these questions, like how do they work with the other research agencies? And then also the inclusiveness question that you mentioned. And that's what they care about. So this is great stuff. So another part of PCORI's mandate is dissemination of research findings on health outcomes, on clinical effectiveness, and on appropriate medical treatments and services. And I was wondering if you could both discuss PCORI's dissemination and implementation activities and what they mean to various groups. Phil, you can speak certainly to what it means for providers, Tony to patients, families, and, and just also the general public. 
Bill, you want to go first? Uh, well, uh, yes. It, it, the, as, as we were talking on, on the first questions that you asked in regard to uh, the fulfillment of, of PCORI's mission, and, and obviously I, I, both Tony and I feel very strongly that uh, we're, PCORI is doing a great job in fulfilling that mission, but part of the mission is the question that you're asking now, uh, how does that information uh, get disseminated? And, and it's, it's fine to do the research the comparative effectiveness research, but which by the way, uh, a lot of the other research that's going on may not be comparative effectiveness research. It may be research on a particular drug, trying to get approval. Uh, uh, is it effective? But not the question is, is it more effective uh, for uh, a, a better price, as an example. And I'm sure we'll get into that discussion uh, a little bit later in, in, the, in the panel. But uh, clearly, I do think that PCORI is also fulfilling that part of the mission of getting that information disseminated. Because otherwise, uh, it just you know, gets uh, in, in the dustbin of history, uh, put on a shelf, and nothing ever happens with it. If you don't get that information out there in a timely manner, uh, then what good is it, as Tony uh, just pointed out in his remar remarks. So, uh, yes, PCORI is doing a good job. Uh, a, a study that I'm familiar with when I was uh, reviewing this and have, have been studying this issue much more uh, than I did when I was a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee on the Republican side back in 2009 and opposed to everything. Uh, today, I'm not opposed to everything. Uh, and I'm much more knowledgeable. Uh, well, I'm still opposed to a few things. Uh, <laughs> let, let's be honest here. Uh, but but the, the, the study in regard to antibiotics and uh, yeah. children uh, at children's uh, hospitals, children's medical centers, and come into the emergency room with a cold or a sore throat, uh, what works best? Uh, you know, do you, you, you give them a, 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 a broad spectrum, think te tetracycline way back, uh, I'm dating myself, or, or do you specifically target with a, a newer drug that it, it is more limited uh, in scope but more effective? Uh, and so studies like that and getting that information to parents so they don't just automatically uh, say whether it's a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant or their primary care physician decides that they're going to put them on floxacillin or, or something, uh, and, and maybe they have this information based on a PCORI study uh, that no, uh, this is probably viral and is not, we don't even need an antibiotic and let's wait a few days. So uh, yes, my answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I would just add to Phil's comments by saying that uh, the, the interesting thing is when PCORI was set up, uh, there was a huge debate on, uh, so okay, so research is done, but a lot of this research gets put in a shelf, mm -hmm. and people just don't go see it. And so how do we get this information out? That was part of the whole legislative uh, questioning and so forth. And dissemination becomes key. And PCORI has really concentrated on that. How do you get it out? It's important. And I think part of it is that on every research project, patients are involved. I remember some of my discussions with Joe on this and so forth. And we as patients don't believe we should do the research. That isn't what it's about. We want the researchers to do the research. But we want to make sure when they're researching about my body that we as patients have a participation in that process. That's all. We want to be involved. We want to tell you about what is happening to us. So when you're doing your research, you can put that on the table as well. And then how do you get it out? If patients are part of every research project, and I understand from Joe and Jean that as a researcher, if you don't have patient involvement, your money's taken away from you. I love that. Um, and so th the question is, is that if, if patients are at the table on this research, 
uh, they get it out and they make sure that people know about it. So it, it, dissemination is the key to all this. And I'm not being critical of NIH and ARC. I'm just saying that they have a different role. And PCORI's role for me as a patient is what I want to pay attention to. The other research is important. I don't have any trouble with that. And it's critical to solving a lot of our problems. But I want the part where we as patients, that there is a research group that pays attention to our quality of life as individuals, and that each of us is different. And how do we, as a different human being, get some guidance and help in solving whatever problem I have? And that's what PCORI does. Yeah, great. Okay, so this is, this is kind of going back in time to creation and inception, so before, before the turning of your, of your view, Phil. Um, so at the time of, of when PCORI was created, a lot of people were concerned about limiting patient and physician options and also limiting patient care costs. Um, because both of you were involved in the process, what were your concerns? And what were your expectations, and do you think they've been met, or have they changed? Uh, well, they've definitely changed. Um, uh, my concerns, and going back to um, 2009 on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, uh, Chairman Waxman, of course, had the, had the majority. Uh, and uh, on the Republican side, on the committee, uh, were a number of physician members. Uh, I don't think at that particular time there may have been one physician member on the Democratic side, uh, but I know for a fact that there were at least three uh, Republican physician members. And I was leading a group, a, a, a caucus uh, created uh, by uh, myself uh, and actually a Democratic member uh, called the, the doctors, doctors' Caucus. And we tried to do it in a bipartisan way, but uh, that devolved pretty quickly. Uh, and it became the Republican Doctors' Caucus. Uh, so I was chairing that, that uh, a group uh, of about 20. Uh, it included physicians and dentists and psychologists and uh, hospital administrators. So people involved in the healthcare space, not just uh, as a physician provider. Uh, so, you know, our, our opposition uh, to comparative effectiveness research uh, and what ultimately became uh, PCORI uh, was, was pretty strong. And it was based on a lot of fear. And it was based on the fact that we, let's be honest, uh, felt that we were carrying the water for our physician colleagues across the country. I won't say necessarily organized medicine, uh, I don't even remember exactly where the a AMA stood uh, on, on the drafting of the Affordable, Affordable Care Act. But the physicians that we represented in our communities, whether we were from Tennessee or, or, or Texas or uh, the great state of Georgia, uh, we felt an obligation. And we felt very strongly. And we were hearing mostly from that side of the issue. Uh, but uh, yes, there was a concern that there would be uh, interruption of the doctor-patient relationship and that uh, patients w would not get a say. Doctors themselves would uh, want to do one thing, but CMS or uh, your uh, third-party payer would say, well, you can't do that based on this comparative effectiveness research and qualities, quality of life years uh, and we were very concerned about that onerous acronym. Uh, so uh, we were concerned. But today, uh, I feel comfortable, uh, and I have uh, been, been assuaded, persuaded, uh, because of the work of PCORI. But I'll finish up quickly and then turn it over to Tony. It, reauthorization, as we all know, is coming up, and that's the big issue you're going to have to convince a whole new group of Republicans and maybe some Democrats that that is not still a concern. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that one of the concerns that we had at that time was to make sure that you didn't in interfere with the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Uh, that's a critical one. 
and that uh, no matter what happens, uh, the patient and the doctor need a strong voice in whatever is done. And uh, making sure that uh, the researchers played their role, but that doctors and patients had their role as well and were basically in the decision-making process. And that was a huge concern. Uh, the House at that time was really uh, feeling strongly that uh, PCORI should be government uh, controlled in effect. Uh, and the Senate was more as to where PCORI is now. And that ultimate decision was made at the White House uh, by President Obama to go with the Senate side. Uh, as a House member, uh, it made a lot of House members up, upset, uh, but I happen to agree with that decision because I like where uh, PCORI is now. Um, so, so basically, those were some of the concerns that were going on. And I think it's really important that PCORI has followed that guidance and that making sure that doctors and patients uh, are part of the decision making and what they do. And that concern that was, well, a lot of us had going back all these years is now something that is a real positive in my view. So I applaud uh, Joe and Jean for their leadership in making sure uh, that, that that happened. Great, I actually have a follow-up question because Phil, I think you raised a really good point that you're still gonna have to convince and there's a whole new crop. So what do you think are gonna be some of the more effective points to make on the Republican side of the aisle? And Tony, what do you think are gonna be the most effective points to make on the, on the Democrat side? I'm gonna take this first, you take it. You go first. I'm in. Okay. Um, I think the issue on the Democratic side is basically uh, going to be um, uh, do we need uh, a, another research group? Not going to be much different than on the uh, Republican side. And so uh, the, all of you in the room that are patients uh, and hopefully physicians and hopefully a lot of you that are researchers uh, will play a role in helping us convince um, members on the Democratic side, uh, that it, it is critical. Uh, you have the FDA that now reaching out to the patient community. You have ARC, you have NIH reaching out to the patient community. And I will say without reservation that none of that would have happened if it weren't for PCORI. That's true. And, 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 and I think that PCORI plays a huge role in that. And so uh, convincing these new members uh, that weren't there uh, when it was set up and the fights that were made and the compromises that were, that were arrived at. Uh, we've got to convince them as to what PCORI is doing, but also convince them that this is not a knock on NIH and ARC. This is complimentary. And that if you are patient focused, now both parties talk about being patient focused, but if you really are patient focused, then you've got to understand what the difference is between what PCORI does and what NIH and ARC does. And if you do understand that, then you'll be supportive of the patient rights to be involved in research making. Okay. Great. Phil? Well, in the uh, panel that, that I attended uh, just before this session, uh, the, the uh, panelists were all uh, Hill uh, staffers uh, are former Hill staffers, so a total of four, two that were there when the Affordable Care Act uh, was passed. Uh, they were there before that when, uh, in a bipartisan way, discussions were held about what would become PCORI uh, and, and how that would be stood up. Uh, and then there were two young staffers, uh, one uh, for a Republican senator and one for a Dem current Democratic senator. Uh, and that these two young men uh, were clearly very, very knowledgeable, very intelligent, uh, but uh, most of the discussion in the facts came from uh, the, the, the uh, lady and, and gentleman who were there, one have, having been staffed uh, for Senator Baucus uh, in the majority, and one 
uh, being a staffer for uh, Senator Orrin Hatch uh, in the minority, both on the Senate Finance Committee. And uh, their, the information that they provided during that hour and 15 minutes was, to me, invaluable. And I think invaluable to, do, to these two young staffers that are going to have to deal with this over the next nine months in regard to reauthorization. Uh, and I could tell that the, the two of them already uh, were working, uh, sitting right side by side like uh, Tony and I are doing now, uh, that they're, they, they're developing or have developed a bipartisan, friendly uh, approach. Uh, and as we get closer to the markup and to the reappropriation, uh, or reauthorization, I should say, uh, and continuing and maybe even plusing, plusing up the uh, uh, PCOR trust fund in the funding aspect, uh, that we'll get there. But it's not going to be easy because uh, the institutional knowledge, a lot of that is gone. Uh, the turnover of, of staffers is what? Uh, every three to five years? And, and uh, Tony and I each serve 12 years. That seems like an eternity, but uh, you know, there's a lot of turnover. So a lot of members on the Energy and Commerce Committee, on the HELP Committee in the Senate, on the Senate Finance Committee, uh, they're, they're gonna, they've got a lot to learn in a short period of time. And it's up to us, the patient advocates, uh, uh, PCORI board members, and methodology committee board members, and uh, the whole spectrum to be in the fight. Phil brings up a good point I just want to add, uh, is that uh, those two uh, young staffers, uh, one is from uh, Senator Kennedy's office from Louisiana, Republican, and the other is from Senator Warner's office. And uh, they were uh, working together, obviously have been, and the hope is that they will be involved with whatever legislation comes forward and pushing it. So if any of you uh, know either of those uh, senators, uh, you ought to thank them for their willingness to be involved and engaged. And if you have some concerns about a particular issue, uh, you should uh, uh, contact them because they're going to play a leading role in this and the Senate side. And we won't know uh, what really uh, is going to happen there until after next Tuesday. But after that, then, this, then is the time to analyze uh, what has happened and who's going to be involved and, and what we can do to go forward uh, based on the elections will determine a lot of what we think we can get through uh, the Congress on reauthorization. Actually, Tony, the, I, I believe the Republican staffer uh, works for Senator Cassidy. Oh, really? Uh, I thought it was... Uh, uh, or, or maybe... maybe yeah, yeah, it is Cassidy. Yeah, yeah. It, right. but both, yeah. Both, both Louisiana. Yeah, both Louisiana. Uh, Senator uh, John Kennedy, another John Kennedy. Uh, uh, and uh, Senator Bill Cassidy. Bill Cassidy, by the way, as you know, is a physician yeah. member and was very, very active when I was uh, a member from uh, 2013 to 2015, I mean, uh, 2003 to 2015. Uh, Bill Cassidy was in the House and uh, a very active member of the uh, Doctors Caucus. Uh, so okay. he's uh, a, a real target for us and a and very thoughtful and cerebral member. Excellent, yes, and the Alliance was pleased to honor him just a couple of years ago for the work that he does, of course, in support of NIH and research in general. Um, we're, uh, we're ready for some questions. Did, uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Sort of open it up. If not, I have a few more. But Somebody put your right cards there. in the air. Somebody right there does. And folks can hand them in. But while we're waiting. There's, let's see, there's a gentleman. Uh, he has, he's, has his hand up. I don't know where the mics are. Where's the mic? Do we have mics? You've got a question. We do, but right we up. have folks that I think we're going to be collecting the questions. Oh, are right, you? here we go. And this gentleman had a, thank you. Whoops. <laughs> All right. This is a good question. What, what do we need to do? Someone's asking, what do we need to do for P PCORI to be reauthorized? Well, it's very easy. And that is to be committed 
to working with your members or members that you know to convince them what PCORI does. Uh, that's the process. And the more you are willing to work, the more it's going to happen. It's not going to happen if those of you in this room, uh, researchers, patients, uh, payers, all of you that are involved and know something uh, about PCORI, if you don't um, get up and work. And that means contacting House members and Senate members and contact and report to PCORI or whoever uh, what you're doing so that information can be brought together and we can find out who really is supporting what they tell you. Um, and uh, some of you probably are a little cynical and that it doesn't make any difference what they tell you, it's what they, how they vote. But what's important is getting that information though and then we can sort of put that all together and, and then pursue it and so on. But it only happens if you're willing to be engaged and involved. And hopefully that's why you're here. And that's right. And, and when you approach uh, members of Congress, uh, either in the House or the Senate, do it in, in a, in a, from a very knowledgeable perspective and do your homework and, and take with you uh, a patient. Uh, someone maybe who is on PCORI's advisory committee and is it there in helping uh, decide uh, which comparative effectiveness research uh, is needed and important to them as a patient from their particular uh, disease process, be it Parkinsonism or epilepsy or, or, or di uh, diabetes. Uh, having that person with you uh, believe me, from my 12 years in, in the Congress, uh, that those are the folks that I paid attention to. They were the ones that tug on my heartstrings. Uh, not necessarily a board member from PCORI or, 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 oh, yes. or some large hospital in my district or uh, a federally qualified health care center or whatever, but I wanted to see a patient, and I think members do, and uh, if you, we approach it in that way, uh, I think we'll be successful. And I'll just add what Phil just said. With that patient that you take, don't think you can speak for them. Let that patient speak. Let that individual, I always tell people when I'm advising and how to approach a member of Congress, that I want that patient to be real. If they get emotional, let them be emotional. If they cry, let them cry. Let them tell their story. And that will impact a member of Congress more than anything else is done. You can give them all the facts in the world. They get lots of facts from everybody. But if there's a story, if there's some emotion to it, if there's a reason why it impacts you, that's what connects. And that's what Phil and I both listened to when we were in the Congress. And that's what you need to do. A lot of times what happens is that people think they should speak for the patient. And I say, no, 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 it's the other way around. Introduce the patient to the elected official and let that patient make the case as it personally impacts them. That's what's key. Absolutely. Excellent. Love it. Absolutely. Good. And, and since they both brought it up, I just want to mention that they're going to be working together on PCORI reauthorization. Um, And the partnership to improve patient care, which Tony chairs, is going to be a key organizer. And uh, my organization, as well as the district policy group, will also be working to, to help organize folks. And if you're interested in getting involved, um, please email Pipsy uh, by contacting Sarah. Sarah, Say, stand up. Sarah at pipsypatients.org. And we'll you know, make that available so folks can find out about it. And you can also email us at the, at the Alliance for Aging Research at info at agingresearch.org. And please get involved. We invite everybody here. Um, we had a great day yesterday. We'll be doing more activities. And these two, how would you not want to be involved with them? <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask another. This is a fantastic question. What would the healthcare world look like today without PCORI? <laughs> well, from 
a, a physician standpoint, if I were back in practice, I'm, I'm not, uh, hope springs eternal, <laughs> um, I, I would probably <clears throat> be doing the same thing that I did 15 or 20 years ago and, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe uh, utilizing information that I obtained for, from the recent OBGYN meeting in Georgia or uh, the national meeting on what's the best treatment for preeclampsia or, or what's a, uh, the, the, how do you work up a patient and what's the best therapy for ovarian cancer, some of these studies that PCORI has, has, has done. But I would be basing that information on, or basing my decision on a very limited amount of information, uh, and I may or may not be right, and yet there was nobody there, and, and maybe uh, today, if it were not for comparative effectiveness research and the work of uh, NIH and the CDC and uh, PCORI and ARC uh, and, and the folks that are involved in, in this comparative effectiveness research so that we would know truly the facts and then we could apply them to the individual patient and we the provider maybe having known that patient and their family for 10 or 15 years understand why uh, the the best qualities uh, uh, option uh, is not necessarily the best option for that patient because of, uh, of, of some unique characteristic, like uh, 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 sending patients home from the hospital uh, that after a hemorrhagic stroke that have uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, sending them home on a blood thinner. Uh, studies, um, in, including PCORI study, may show that uh, they're going to have less adverse events, strokes, uh, heart attacks, uh, if they're on this uh, uh, blood thinner, uh, whether it's uh, a fractionated uh, heparin or, 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 or a Coumadin or, or one of these newer drugs. But hey, I know that my patient is very prone to nosebleed, and he or she doesn't want to be on that medication and wake up in the middle of the night with a, with a handful of blood and have to go to the emergency room and spend five hours while somebody tries to cauterize or pack and finally stop that. They go through that three or four times, they're gonna say to you, uh uh doc, I don't, uh, I'll take a baby aspirin, but don't put me on a heparin or, or Coumadin. So this is a, the, the, the thing that, that I wanna point out from a practicing physician. Uh, how I would look at it. Isn't he good? I think he's amazing. <laughs> he's good. And having a doctor that really understands this is critical, and I mean that, Phil, Thank so you, I, I really appreciate your Thank being you. engaged. Um, it's easy for me to answer that question, and that is we as patients would be outside the door saying, let me in. Uh, we're now in the room helping uh, the researchers come up with something that deals with my quality of life. We'd be knocking on the door. We'd be screaming like we did before. We'd be accusing NIH and ARC of not paying attention to us, and we wouldn't be getting anywhere. So the fact that PCORI is there has changed dramatically, in my view, uh, the healthcare system. Have we got everything that we want and need? No, of course not. Are we on the right track? you damn right we are. Uh, for a patient, we've made tremendous progress. For a patient, uh, the difference between 12 years ago and today is dramatic. And we want to keep that. So we do not want to go back. I don't care what any of these new legislators think and so forth. What we have with PCORI is critical if you're interested in patient care, if you're interested in patient centeredness. And both parties use patient centeredness. I wish they both knew what they meant when they say it. But patient centeredness is what we're all about in this room. And that's what we have to do is to convince these members of the House and the Senate that when they say patient centeredness, they're talking about what we talk about. 
that they understand that patients need to be at the table. We don't want to go back outside the door. We want to stay inside the room. All right. Good. That was great. All right. Well, it's time for us to wrap up. I know we could continue talking all afternoon. Please join me in thanking both of these amazing gentlemen. And, and let's also thank Sue, you know, because this is a pretty amazing discussion. You know, I can't see you individually, but I can tell that this room is full from here to the way in the back, and that almost every stakeholder that's involved in the healthcare system is represented here today. So I think that's just an enormous achievement um, for all of us. And so everyone in this room on the stage has a lot to be proud of, and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. So here's where you need to go. We have a poster session upstairs. We have a half hour until the next plenary for you to chat, um, to meet with your friends, meet new colleagues. We have people from outside of the United States here and people from almost every state in the country. So one more round of applause for our panel. And we'll see you at 1.30.